Let's have another look back at the town family. You'll recall that we have a genealogy that shows a number of descendants of William Town through 9, 10, and as many as 11 generations down here. What we did before with the Town family is we used these individuals to estimate how often there's a mutation as we go from generation to generation down the family tree. And we did that by making a Bayesian model with binomial prob probabilities as to how many mutations should be seen after a certain number of generations and in a certain number here, usually 37 loci in the genome that were being looked at. And we didn't use in our estimate for R these outliers because we thought that they just looked a little bit funny. They just had way more mutations than the ones in the set we did include. And we commented at the time that we didn't really have a rigorous way of dealing with that. Now that we have p-values, we can ask different kinds of questions. We can ask, is T11 here a descendant of William Town? Or is he the result of what's euphemistically called a non-paternal event? A non-paternal event means that somewhere along this line there's a son who is not really the biological son of the father shown on the diagram here. And I'll leave it to your imagination to understand how that might have happened. Similarly, we might ask about T T13 over here, who had four mutations, but only 12 loci were checked. Now that we understand p-value tests, we can ask this kind of question, because we can say that the null hypothesis is, for example, that T11 is a descendant of William Town, and we can ask, what is the probability that we should see this number of mutations, or this or a more extreme number of mutations, given that null hypothesis? We couldn't do this before, because as Bayesians, we could frame the hypothesis that he was a descendant, but we couldn't frame all the possible alternative hypotheses of him not being a descendant. Now if we really knew R, then the calculation of the p-value, the tail probability, would be very straightforward. So for example, for individual T11, the tail value would be the binomial probability, in other words, the probability of seeing a certain number of mutations, and we would sum that probability from the value that we actually see, 5, through all more extreme values all the way up to 37, the total number of loci. Now as an aside here, you'll recall that we had to make an assumption that we were neglecting back mutation, and you can see how that assumption comes into this formula here. We're going to sum only up to 37 because there are only 37 loci in which we could detect mutations. But actually, the number of possible mutations could have been 9 generations times 37 loci. The reason that this approximation is OK is that when we do this sum, by the time we're getting up to high values here, these probabilities are going to be very small and not affect the answer. But that's not the problem. The problem is we don't really know what value of r to put in here for the binomial probability. We have Bayesian uncertain knowledge about r, and you'll recall that was summarized by a statistical model here. We used a prior 1 over r because that was the scale independent non-informative prior, and we came out with a probability distribution that I'm just reminding you looks something like this. Now a common practice, I would say a common frequentist practice, that we've already mentioned in passing is that when there are both parameters in a model and you want to estimate the goodness of fit of a model, you simply take the maximum likelihood value of those parameters and then you just press forward and do your goodness of fit or your p-value tail test. And in that case, we would choose as our value of r, the peak value that's up here, looks to me like it's about 0.03, and then we would use that value up here in the tail test. 
The trouble is, here we can see very clearly that's just going to be wrong. And the reason is, the probabilities for T11 to have as many as five mutations are going to be dominated by the possibility that the value of R is not 0.03, but is somewhat larger. And that somewhat larger is allowed, as we see in this Bayesian probability calculation. It's allowed with reduced probability in its own right, but it is still allowed. So we have to find some way of, of using not just the maximum likelihood value of R, but this whole distribution that we've lovingly computed. There's a modern way to do this, and that is, it's pretty obvious, it's that we have a probability distribution for R, so let's just integrate over that posterior probability distribution. This has a name, this is called posterior predictive p-value, and it's an example of a method that lives in a kind of a shadowy space between Bayes methods and frequentist methods. It's called empirical Bayes. Empirical Bayes is a set of methods that uses the data to get a preliminary idea of what some prior distributions should be, or I should say of what some posterior distributions should be, and then uses those distributions in tests that often resemble frequentist tests, but can also be further Bayesian uses. So if we do that here, we'll take our previous estimate, which was the sum of the tail from 5 to 37 of the probability of seeing that many mutations. But now we'll integrate it from 0 to infinity over all pass possible values of R, multiplying by that blue curve on the previous slide, the probability of those values of R. And then just to emphasize that this is a weighted average, we would in principle divide by the integral from 0 to infinity of the probability of r. Of course, if we've normalized that curve correctly, the denominator here will be just 1. So I've done that. I used Mathematica to do the numerical integrals over r here. You don't have to do them very accurately. We're only interested in one or two significant figures on the p-value. And here's how the results came out. Well, remember this guy down here, this is T2, and he had 23 mutations, and the chances that he is actually a descendant of William Town, I should say the p-value for that hypothesis, is 1 times 10 to the minus 13. That's pretty much ruled out. Now for T11 here, he had five mutations, and the numerical integral when you do it comes out with a p-value of about 1%. So that's significant. The null hypothesis was that he's a descendant. That hypothesis is significantly ruled out. He's quite likely not a descendant. And then over here, we had the 4 out of 12, and that has one of these very small p-values, again, around one part in a 1,000. So the answer is we were right to leave these questionables out. They're unlikely to be descendants of Williams Town, and we probably should not be using them when we try to estimate the parameter r as we did in the previous lesson. And to show you that things work out fairly consistently, here's an example of someone that we did include on the previous analysis, and indeed the p-value for this individual comes out 12% which is larger than, say, 5%, the magic value. Therefore, the null hypothesis is not significantly ruled out. And as far as we can tell, this person is a descendant of William Town. So this would be a pretty clean result, a satisfactory end to the Town story, except that there is a loose end left. And that loose end is that we originally did taint the data when we computed that probability distribution for R because we decided rather ad hoc to leave out T2, T11, and T13. Now T2 we can see is hopeless, but what would we have gotten if we had included T11 and T13 from the very start? That is to say, the model that we use would be the previous model times these two extra binomial factors to include T11 and T13 in the model.
Well, instead of getting the blue curve here for R, we would have gotten this rather different green curve because T11 and T13 simply have more mutations and that would have raised our estimate for the mutation probability. And if we use the green curve and go back and do that p-value calculation, we'll find that the numbers change. Now, T2 changed from 10 to the minus 13 to 10 to the minus 11, so there's no real change in that result. And T13 also changes, but is still a significant result. So T2 and T13 are still strongly ruled out as descendants of William Town. But T11, when we include him in the estimate for R, crosses the line. He jumps from being a significantly ruled out result, being not a descendant, to not being ruled out as a descendant. There's still hope for T11 here. This is an actual methodological problem with posterior predictive p-value. Data is being used twice. It's being used first to get a posterior and then again to test itself. Often you can get away with this in just the kind of way we've illustrated here. If you have pieces of data that you're not sure whether to include them or not, try with the questionable data, try without the questionable data, and if you have conclusions that are robust, that are the same either way, then those are reasonable conclusions to draw. However, sometimes, as in this example, you'll find that posterior predictive p-value is not quite self-consistent. If you include the data, you get one result. If you don't include the data, you get the other result. And we've seen that in this example. T11 is left ambiguous when we're trying to figure out whether he's a descendant of William Town. If you're left with a little bit of a dissatisfied feeling, a feeling that how can statistics really be a science if we have to try things in, try things out, make value judgments. I'm with you. This is where we need real Bayes. And we're going to return to the town family one more time later and try to do this same kind of a thing by a fully Bayesian analysis.